All right, well, we might as well, we might as well get started. Do you, Mr. Dwyer, you want to um, just give a brief first of what the planning, what everybody knows exactly what you're working on with the bylaw and then what we're going to add to it as far as, you know, some type of permit to try to make things easier than the present bylaw? Sure. So we adopted our original flood overlay district bylaw back in 1987 uh, in response to a mandate from, uh, from the state. <clears throat> and as part of that, we added a section allowing for what we called mobile recreational uses along the river. Uh, that was a response to the first generation of people saying, I'd like to set up a camp by the river or I'd like to park my trailer by the river. Um, and that's been amended a couple of times in a couple of different ways, <clears throat> nothing particularly relevant. Um, but we now have a new mandate from Boston, Massachusetts Emergency Management to update our uh, flood district overlay river, riverfront bylaws. And as part of doing that, we uh, decided to take another look at the um, at the uh, uses by the river. Uh, the old bylaw required allowed you to put a uh, trailer or a camper down by the river, but required a special permit for every installation. That was never effectively enforced. And um, I think only a handful of people ever got special permits. Uh, so we decided that to try to make it uh, simpler. And um, instead of requiring a special permit for every use, well, first of all, let me say the, the other changes, the technical changes to the flood district overlay and what can be done in the floodplain, uh, you know, pretty much what the state wants to see every town have. So we're not going to really spend too much time, uh, more, too much more time on that. But I think what everybody's interested in is uh, the RVs. We, we changed the terminology to match the federal regulations. We call them recreational vehicles. There's a definition in the uh, bylaw of what those are, which is copied word for word from the FEMA regulations. And the uh, goal here is to create a simpler process to allow people to use riverfront property uh, with a permit from the Community Floodplain Administrator, which is another title for the building inspector in most cases, and a special permit from the ZBA in certain circumstances. In addition, there will be other regulations that will apply to anyone, well, they apply to anyone anywhere in town outside the zoning bylaw, and that uh, are the regulations of the Conservation Commission, which has responsibility for development in the uh, floodplain and the floodway, and um, the regulations of the fire department, which sometimes come into play. Uh, also, the fire chief has expressed an interest in being sure he knows how to get to you if you call an ambulance. Um, so I think a lot of what we're talking about here, as, as I see it, is that we're trying to work out a, ways to make sure that this reflects everybody's uh, interests without jeopardizing the obligation of the town to protect everyone. I guess in a nutshell, I'm happy to go into more detail but um, I think the, the big things that we're still talking about and that will co be coming into town meeting um, are whether uh, what we don't have complete consensus on the planning board is allowing more than one recreational vehicle per lot. Uh, that's something we're still talking about. And if we do allow more than one, what kind of separation, how much area do, does the lot have to have so we don't create a public health 
nightmare down by the river. Oh, the Board of Health has some say in some of these things too. So, uh, Tom, is that enough? Yeah, thank you. No, I, I would, that was one of my questions to you was going to be what, at this point, you, are you kind of waiting for the Board of Health's decision on what the distance from the river, how that's going to be determined where the campers can't be as far as if there could be more than one per square footage, you know, or something like that? Well, that, yeah, we definitely would be looking for some input from the Board of Health on that. Um, or, and conservation. And, and conservation as well, uh, mm -hmm. because um, regardless of the zoning history of this property, of these properties along the river, um, the zoning bylaw cannot excuse. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Wait, what can I get for you? Uh, yes, can I get a. Um... Could I get a uh, the zoning bylaw does not uh, excuse compliance with uh, the Wetlands Protection Act, the Rivers Act, or anything else under the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission. So is any Mr. Pellicer or is anybody else from the conservation that wants to talk about it? What what you're um, looking for as far as that would be the first start as far as distance and whatever away from the uh, river, however you want to go by that. Well, Conservation Commission is regulated by the State Wetlands Protection Act and the Riverfront rules. So any new work that's being proposed has to meet strict guidelines, um, specifically not within the first hundred feet, if at all possible. Um, docks need to have permits. One thing we've been trying to get out to people that um, many of the docks along the river are only temporary dock permits or they have an expiration date and people are responsible for knowing what those dates are. We don't have a record of that. So that's where we're coming from. So as far as the process goes, it would you'd want to probably go before they even if, um, submitted the permit or, or take at least their plot plan or, or their plan and see where they proposed before it was even reviewed, you know, by the checklist that we all come up with? Um, if we have a staff person at the meeting that's looking at the checklist or um, in a number of communities, I know for certain things, they have a checklist that goes around to each department before they even go for filing or they get their permit. Um, so we would have to, yeah, I mean, we would have to look at it. We would want to make sure that whatever gets put into zoning doesn't conflict with the Wetlands Protection Act. So that's what we need to look at. So would you, as far as a list for, you know, to give out to the people applying, would, um, would you be able to come up with some type of list that we could, you know, start the actual application with? Because that would be the most important? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And then, of course, Board of Health would be next as far as anything with water, sewage, or I think you had said, uh, Mr. Mish, 25 feet was what you would be probably looking for, but that would be if there was three or more. Um, right. Campers. Yeah, multiple trailers. Um, the state considers a campground anything three or more. Um, currently, the only place that's got three or more that's permitted is Mitch's Marina, and his separation is 25 feet, which uh, works well for the Board of Health and even worked uh, during the COVID regulations for separation. So, I mean, I think that's a good number. And then chief for fire, but we'll just come up with a list to add, right? As far as what you're looking on the plan. Yep. We're just looking for proper access in the event of a, an emergency for fire or medical services. Um, so some sort of an identification of the lot, if possible. Uh, permitting for uh, flammable fluid storage. So folks are storing propane, uh, which is not incorporated into the campers that they have there. Um, that requires a permit through the fire department 
Um, if it's on the equipment and it's USDOT certified, then that's not required. And there's really no regulations now for uh, having a cooking fire in that area. It would just be notifying the fire department if you're going to do it just so that you don't get so that we don't get calls from folks driving by thinking something's going on. On the emergency management side, it would just be uh, hopefully getting contact information so that if we if we did have an emergency situation with the river going up quickly, like we've had in the past, we would be able to uh, at least notify the folks that own uh, the campers or equipment um, to see if it's, it's possible for them to get up and pull them away from the river or how we would handle that part. So that would be something we'd like to coordinate with them, um, everybody that wants to do this. Thank you. <clears throat> Can anybody from ZBA make it? Just as a note, the notice that we got from Didi today said yeah. the meeting started at 6.30. It said oh. 6.30? I apologize. Okay. Yeah. Well, I didn't realize, Didi, I've never met you, so it, uh, it says hello. talk to you. <laughs> Yeah, I just got a message saying, hey, how come you're not at the meeting? So that's why I logged in early. Yeah, it said 6.30 in one place and 6 in another. So yeah. I'm sorry I was late too. I apologize. It's been a crazy day with, with Zoom meetings. No problems. But so, Tommy, I think which, what we really need to kind of get across is why we're forming this whole committee is basically to reach out to the property owners and then also uh, the people then that will be camping and um, how we're going to just try to get a whole list together from each, you know, planning, ZBA, conservation, our department, fire department, um, just in uh, Board of Health as to kind of what we're looking for as, as far as safety purposes and just to keep a uh, you know, so every year we know who's camping. So like Mike said, if there's an emergency, things like that, we're gonna be able to uh, have contact. So that's basically one of our main goals as part of this committee. And I believe the, the planning wanted it, do we, we'd be notifying all the property owners, not any of the individual campers. Right. right. So as far as um, Sally or Johnny, did you have any? Anything you wanted to comment on? Hi. Um, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Sally. Yeah, I was just going to say, being um, brand new to it, um, I did read through the. Doc oh, sorry, I did read through the documents that were shared this morning um, to try to get an understanding. But I'm just wondering if if the plan is to use sort of the the Nixle system. Is that what it's called for emergency notifications to those owners, or would it be a separate? system i just trying to catch up to speed where it would most likely be the nixle system that okay. we were using in the emergency management side of it okay thank you that was just a question i had on the that i didn't see yep. thank you. so one of the things that i was under the impression on when we joined this committee was to come up with a bylaw to help replace what was kind of inadequate with the original one. Um, I'm assuming Bill Dwyer's draft is just a draft because there's a lot of issues that need to be addressed in it. Um, as somebody who's camped on the river for the past 30 years, um, I, I see a lot of areas that need improvement on, on the draft that he put together. I believe we do need to do something for the sanitation to have something in there that you have to have a contract with um, a certified sewer company to eject your camper or sandy can, you know, with the board of health regulations. Um, and definitely with, with some kind of like Mike, how the police and fire fire department does uh, for the business owners for point of contacts. Um, understandably, we have not had, a flood situation in camping season since 1936. Most people who have campers have a big investment in them and, and aren't gonna leave them in the waterway flood area. I know I'm one of them that follows the NOAA 
flood maps, projections. Uh, Mitch's Marina does. They share them. We share them on our Facebook groups. So people are well aware of when the high water is coming in. You know, take precautions with that. You know, they're not going to lose their, their major investments. So I, I think we definitely need to spend some time um, on the wording that Bill had sent out this morning. Unfortunately, it was only sent out this morning. So we didn't have much time to uh, digest it fully. So my, my understanding is a little different. You basically, the planning board's working on the bylaw, um, but what this group is working on is sort of the underlying, how's it going to be, how's it going to be administered? Um, I'm not quite, I'm not sure. You basically, the bylaw as drafted here is an improvement over what we have in place now. And I just want to make, make sure everyone understands that. Well, one of the things, Bill, you think it's an improvement. Personally, I don't. Um, you have one recreational vehicle per lot size. You don't have what size you can have or how many campers you can have on a lot. You're asking people to post a bond. And you're asking them to give permission to the town to remove their, their RVs in case of a flood. I know when I used to keep my camper down Aqua Vita at 112 feet, my camper was totally fine there. It might be different in different areas. So what mm -hmm. gives the town authority to come in and pull out my camper and what, you know, what's deemed a flood at that point. So th that's, that's where I think we should, we need to look at it. Okay. I, I just want to get across and I'm happy to talk about some changes and there are some things that we would, uh, uh, yeah, probably aren't that important. But if this doesn't pass, we revert to what is what we now have, which requires a special permit for every installation and has a lot of these requirements in it as well. So we're not really working with a blank slate here. I just want to get that across. That uh, no, I you know, I totally understand that. I know we need to do some changes, but let's make sure we do the right changes. We have only a little bit of time to do it and get input. That's why I thought this committee was about the river bylaw flood district committee. So if we can have input from, from the members of the committee, we can make it right. So for May town meeting, we can have the right bylaw going in to replace the outdated one. The, um, so uh, yeah, I, don't, I realize that having more than one uh, RV on a lot is, um, is of interest. When this was originally drafted, no one mentioned having more than one. So uh, we are trying to make allowances for more than one. So Bill, one question, um, if we work backwards, when does, does the planning board need to have a finalized version and hold your public hearing prior to town meeting? The public hearing just has to be a week or so before town meeting. Um, the war, uh, I'm not sure when the warrant is gonna close for town meeting. I think it might be sometime in March. In the past, we have been, will, we have been able to uh, reserve articles even after the warrant has closed. Uh, and not have to get a final text submitted uh, when the, before the warrant closes. So I'm gonna say we have about a month to work on this. But again, uh, to your point, Johnny, yeah, the, the planning board is actually working on this at our meetings. So um, this committee is not really focused is not designed to write a bylaw um, although we'd be happy for for the input uh, but the best place for that input is to a planning board meeting this committee is sort of looking at how the details are going to be worked out after the bylaw is adopted and just so we're clear so maytown meeting say this new bylaw passes Memorial Day, most people get their campers down the river. 
the attorney general's office has how many days to approve the changes in a bylaw? Uh, so, <laughs> as much as long as they want, basically. Right. So whoever's going in in May is going to be with the old bylaw regardless. No, it, the new bylaw will be considered effective as of the date of the publication of the first notice of the public hearing. It could be, if the attorney general doesn't approve it, then we revert back to the old bylaw. But uh, <clears throat> the new bylaw will take effect for this season if it is approved at town meeting. Okay, so what I will do is I'll, I'll send over an email to you on, on the wording of the bylaw, just concerns I've, I've had from numerous residents and campers um, you know, that heard I was on the committee, so. Okay. I'll send that to you. Uh, did I send it in word format so you can edit it? I believe so. No, I it's PDF. it's PDF. I can I can edit a PDF though. I'm, okay. I'm savvy enough. Johnny, can you actually get any of the people so it's only presented one time to the planning or, you know, not as many people doing it do it all for all them on that one plan for them? The one 100% uh, and, and that's one of the things that I, I was approached by so many people as, as being a member of the committee thinking that that's what we were doing. So they've addressed concerns to me and I can write the changes on behalf of the group. And really right now, our, our concern, of course, is that bylaw. But even this coming summer, I mean, we're going to try to do everything that we can or that we were looking for to doing, but it might not all happen exactly this year. Am I correct? Correct, but it'd be nice to get, you know, everything going with this. And, and so it's all included with the bylaw, what, what we're gonna have, you know, so we can work on it. So the following year, it's all in place and smooth. Right, right. Cause this year, I mean, that's, that's our, our goal, but it is coming up quite quick. So it's, you know, we're, we're hoping that by next year, this will be so much smoother and, and easier for everybody. Yeah, I, I think you're just going to be hit with, uh, I don't think you have the capacity to process no. applications from everyone who should be filing an application. Um, but this can draw in input from conservation, fire, health, about what should be, what are the issues that need to be reviewed as you are considering approving something. And then the, the bylaw, the, the part about rec uh, special permits for uh, multiple units does need some fleshing out, some of which uh, Board of Health just provided with some separation, minimum square footage, um, and the problem is that not every lot down there is the same. Um, some uh, sort of slope down to the water very gently and some have a 30 foot drop to the water. Um, so that's where really the ZBA would be best equipped to um, look at uh, things on a lot by lot basis. Bill, what about the setback regulations from the property line? Some of those lots are narrow, and, you know, if somebody's looking for multiple trailers, will they have to uh, maintain those separations, you know, whatever zoning says, side lots, et cetera, et cetera? That is something that uh, it's going to be sort of a case-by-case -case basis because, you um, these aren't structures, so the usual setback rules don't apply. On the other hand, uh, <clears throat> someone could have a multi-acre parcel that's only 90 feet wide or right. less. Um, <clears throat> and if you, you want to put three trailers uh, or three campers side by side at the waterfront, um, yeah, it's going to be hard. And you would still have to take an effect if the, you know, because it isn't a bylaw that if a neighbor gave you permission, you can, um, you know, go up to the property line with an accessory structure or, or trailer that. But if they didn't allow that, you probably would have to resort back to the 15 feet, I would assume, Mr. Dwyer, correct? 
Um, I'm not sure on 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 the trailers. Uh, they're not they're not structures. Right. Right. Yeah. So I guess it guess that wouldn't be enforced. So what what is your feeling on it? Is the planning allowing a certain amount of square footage and is allowing more than one per parcel? Do you think it's a far stretch with the board or what? That's what something where there, there was some dis a lot of discussion at our last meeting and not complete agreement. Um, we're hoping to provide some guidance for the ZBA in the bylaw. And um, we'll uh, that so that's part of part of the process here to you know, get some input on what is a reasonable amount of square footage with a reasonable amount of uh, separation. And Bill, can I just share, uh, I think I can share, can I just share or I'm not uh, sure who's running. <laughs> if I can just share something just so people have an idea of what the, the riverfront regulations require because it substantially limits how much clearing an area you can have. And it's nothing within, it's, um, there are specific requirements for when the lot was created or um, if nothing's been done on it, if it transferred property owners, things like that. So it's just a quick little thing if I can just share it. You want a screen share? Yeah. Okay, yep, let me. I think I can. Because when um, I went to do it, it said I could, or it was showing. Uh, yes, you should be okay. able to do it. All right, I'm just going to show this quick. So this is the state law. This is what the Conservation Commission has to enforce. So riverfront area, alteration limited to 5,000 square feet or 10% of the total riverfront area, whichever is greater for lots recorded before um, 10697 or 10% for lots recorded after. And it requires 100 feet of undisturbed vegetation. And then for lots recorded prior to that, the issuing authority shall allow, and this is a dealing with a single family house, but it gives you an idea of what the restrictions are under the Wetlands Protection Act, which this is not the commission's regulations. These are things that DEP would be enforcing also. So just as an FYI. So somebody had asked if it was gonna be a, I believe it was an annual permit or, and we, that's something we need to discuss here. If, if you know, if it was going to be something every year that had to be revisited or if it was the same, if it could be for so long, we need to discuss that and, and see. It's going to be a lot of work doing it every year, but there's probably going to be changes every year. So um, at that point, that property, at a minimum, I would think would have to be, you know, revisited with a new permit. Yeah, and conservation, a permit from the Conservation Commission is good for three years. Okay. Unless extended by the governor, so it would be a three-year permit. So what does everybody think if that's start, you know, three years, unless there was some type of change, you know, the permit would be good for three years? I think that's a good idea. Yes. Keep it three years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> I agree. Good. Yep, sounds reasonable. Yep. That just saved a lot of work. I was hoping, I was hoping it wasn't going to be every year. <laughs> we do not know somebody just asked about how many rvs are along the connecticut river um somebody that's out there every day have an idea on the hadley side not as many as in hatfield <laughs> <laughs> okay. they're not allowed there how can that be <laughs> Good question. Uh, you, yeah, there's there's a few of them out there, but it's, I mean, they're scattered. There's there's only a few places that you'll see if you go up and down on a boat. And I know you guys or the ConCom has been out there. Um, 
you know, from North Hadley down to, down to South Hadley around past Mitch's Marina, you know, there's, there's a few, but it's not an overabundance as opposed to the other side of the river as well. Yeah. I mean, the one difference is Hadley has a very long shoreline along the river. So percentage wise, we would have more than some of the other communities that don't have as much shoreline. And yeah, we've gone out and we've just, um, you know, just to get an idea for, we've been coming up with our river rules as far as to let people know. I think that kind of spurred some of the action on this committee. Um, so the commission, you know, the permits are good for three years. Dock permits are a whole different um, ball of wax. They do not go hand in hand, 100% with the Conservation Commission permit. And there are probably a lot of people along the river whose permits have expired because many of them are not transferable to um, between property owners. So Johnny, how many how many properties actually now would you, you know, I know it's a guesstimate, but would you say is there with campers, is there 50 and probably 100 on the river when with just a ballpark, what would you say permits would be coming in? So I would say you, you probably permitted campers, you're probably going to have 75 to 100 coming in. I mean, that's, that's a high number. And to get through Conservation Commission um, would be, you know, if they don't already have a permit, which many of them didn't have permits, um, that's going to take a while. So not sure how that would fit. We'll see. And we kind of started this committee, too, because uh, after COVID, so this past summer, we were getting bombarded with phone calls, um, actually by some of the people that, like Johnny, and every, that have been on the river for years. And then a lot of other people were just coming in with their campers and it was friends of friends. And um, then we had some concerns because then uh, there was one area, I want to say more, it might've been on the Aquavita side, that they were starting to cut down a bunch of trees. Um, and I think the problem is, is a lot of the people that are might be there with the campers, not all of them are the property owners and don't know all of the rules and regulations either by the river. And so that's why we figured we really need to start getting a handle on this now. And, and I totally understand the whole cutting down of trees. I, I've seen some areas where they clear cut lots but all in all, you'll, you have to admit that places with campers on them are policed by people. There's no litter, no trash. Look at Mitch's Island. That place turned into a disaster from, you know, day trippers who go out there and, and camp for a weekend. Most RV people are considerate about the land because they're there. They don't want their septic leaking out. They don't want to be smelling crap while they're sitting next to the river enjoying themselves. Yes, but the part of the problem is the clearing of the vegetation. It's not so much once they're there and they've got an established spot. It's the clearing of the vegetation um, along the riverbanks, um, wanting to put in docks, creating paths down there. Those are all the things that um, impact the environment versus the camping experience. That's all. And, and I totally agree with you, Paula, on, on clear cutting, you know, the trees. I, I understand that within a hundred feet, you need to get a permit. You know, we've never cut anything down where we used to camp on Aquavita. And, you know, every time a lightning hit a tree, we took a picture of it and, and then cut it. So we'd have documentation. Yeah. Riverfront is actually 200 feet, Johnny. Yeah, it's been a few years. 
<laughs> and if I could just add again, none of this has anything to do with the bylaw. I mean, this is what we're talking about, but right. conservation is, is and zoning are completely different realms. So mm -hmm. the nothing in the zoning bylaw will have any effect on what the Conservation Commission has authority to do. Um, I do have a um, couple of questions. Um, one is uh, standard dimension for a lot. Um, there, there, there currently is a standard dimension for a lot, which is basically 30,000 square feet and a square shape. However, uh, many of the riverfront properties uh, uh, actually reflect the almost medieval agricultural history of Hadley, where you have long, narrow lots. And uh, in most cases, those lots, as long as they are not in current ownership within a butter, as long as they remain a separate little strip of land, um, each one is they're not really buildable per se, because you could have trouble fitting in your setbacks if you only have a 40 foot wide strip, even if you have an acre, but um, they would support a camper as long as they were not in common ownership, as long as they were not two lots in common ownership, then they would be considered to be merged. And then again, they'd only support one, not two. Um, but a lot of the land down there is usable on this level. We do have another bylaw that says no new residential construction in the Hadley floodplain, which is somewhat different than the FEMA floodplain. Um, so some of those lots down there are not buildable, even though they, for zoning purposes, they, you know, they're usable. So that new construction, is that for residential or for commercial? Residential. No new residential construction in the Hadley floodplain, which is on uh, shown on that uh, the map that I sent you. Okay. Now, the largest camper you probably would see on the river is maybe 40 feet long, which is extremely large, eight feet wide. So you're looking at 320 square feet. So I think we need to come up with something for a square footage for that to be comparable. We use the, um, we use the FEMA regulation, which allows uh, 400 square feet. So changing the lot size so you wouldn't have one camper per building lot. FEMA uses 400 square feet. So how many campers no, can we put? FEMA uses 400 square feet for the camper. That's oh, for camper size. Okay. Camper size. Okay. So that being said, 400 square feet is not a 2,000 square foot house. So in relation, we should definitely ease up on how many campers are allowed. And if it's as Greg said earlier, the 25 feet between, we should look at being easing that up. We'd be happy to look at it. If you want to come up with a formula, that, that'd be great. Yeah, we can, we can come up with something and, and for you guys to look at and you know, again, the Board of Health to look at and CONCOM. And you meet again, uh, the Planning Board next Tuesday night, Mr. Dwight? Next Tuesday. So you'd love to, sooner the better. So Johnny, if you could get that and, and some kind of formula, if you want to work on that, just send it to, you know, all the, all the members and then we could just, you know, say we're good with it and, and forward it so it came from one person or suggest anything that needs to be changed. You know, maybe that would work to present to the, the planning board and, and see how that goes. Yeah, we'll we'll get that to you within a day or so. Okay. 
because you don't want to hear from from a whole bunch of people, Mr. Dwyer, right? If we can just bring it, you know. If you could get focused, uh, channeled through Johnny, that's that's fine. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm happy to hear from anybody, but um, we're trying to put together something. So yeah, getting getting it through one source would be fine. Uh, I think there were a couple of other questions. Lot, how many RVs? How many permits? Mm -hmm. um, so um, one person asked a question about we've been camping for the past three years and got a permit. Then um, Paulette replied to that that um, if, if the permit would have been from conservation and not the special permit that were that was required in the current bylaw because those there are only a couple of those that were ever out, ever approved and if well, there were fi five of those that were approved i'd be surprised well there was two that came in front um for the zba within the past uh th about three years so they could have gotten their permit through the zba okay but that's the thing people don't realize that um, that's what needs to be done. Um, now, I know on my end, I was getting more complaints. And Johnny, I don't know, if, is there a lot of campers over on the Aquavita side? I know there's quite a few houses, but. There's, yeah, there's a, a larger area when you get from the paved to the dirt road area. Um, and then where we were off Sandy Beach Road, uh, next to Ted Kozier's area, we, we actually stayed at Al Zahowski's place. Um, there's, there's spotty campers in that area, um, but up towards the paved, where it goes from paved road to dirt road. And a lot of the neighbors had issues up there. Um, they actually just didn't like the people around there. So, so the police were involved with, with different altercations in there. Right. I mean, that's most of the complaints were coming from that side. Um, and the fact that the, the river itself, too, was getting a little out of control um, as far as jet skis and the, uh, too many boats. So a, a lot of the people there I know in the houses were starting to complain a lot about um, a lot of campers. And I, I think in some areas, the problem is, is some of the campers were younger aged groups that were out there. And um, I think that those are the ones that the police did have to go out to a couple times. And, and Didi, I will tell you 100%, because when we had our camper there, we had a sandy can down. Um, Parker's Portables would come down and pump it out every couple weeks. We had boats randomly pulling up to use the sandy can. They'd see it there. The issue you have with boulders and jet skis is a total separate, don't right. even that with about the campers because they are two separate groups right and just i'm going to say this uh from a personal perspective not from the board of health perspective but this summer the the camping and the river use was probably two or three times what it has been just because folks were locked down they couldn't engage in normal recreation and the river became a place for them to just get out of the house and go to so in other years where during the week there'd be one or two boats on the river this past summer, you know, there'd be a, a dozen boats on the river. And I think when that happens all at once, uh, you know, the neighbors on Aquavita got excited and, and mm -hmm. other folks uh, caused some trouble because they weren't used to camping on the river. So we'll see how it goes going forward. But I think this past year was a little bit of an anomaly uh, compared to past years used to you're hundred percent right, Greg. We, I actually was out of work for quite a bit due to COVID related issues and couldn't do anything. So we spent a lot of time on the river rainbow beach. You couldn't even find a spot on a Wednesday afternoon. And that was never like that. Same with the Everglades beach over by Northampton, um, community rowings boathouse where we row out of, um, huge there's that big sandbar that's formed and tons and tons of people they're walking in they're not camping they're walking in or it used to be the boaters that would pull up and they were fine 
And now it's the, the day trippers, the partiers and everything, leaving their trash. We've had so much problems, vandalism, people pooping in our motorboats, like just disgusting. Um, and, you know, I would say as a person who's on the water every single day in the summer in a small little rowing skull, um, the residents along the, that are camping along or that have the campers along the, the river are kind and they get us and mm -hmm. they're respectful. They slow down, they wave. Um, it's, you know, folks that are day boaters, you know, putting in at some of the different marinas, I think down towards the south. Um, and they come ripping up. Um, and it's, yeah, it's this summer was insane on the river. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would agree. Yeah, unfortunately, most of those crews come from the state ramp where they don't pay any fees. And yeah. just, and that's why Mitch's and, and such is banned jet skis. Yeah. It. So I think there's separate issues. I think one is there's no cutoff point for how many uh, boats can be on the river. Mm -hmm. So it can just fill and fill and fill and fill. And then people have want to pull over. They want to swim. They want to go in the woods to do what they're going to do. So um, I think there's just, there's just multiple issues, you know. Do we miss any other questions, Mr. Dwyer? Uh, sounds like we got everything. So again, it's multi-jurisdictional. Conservation, health, um, zoning, um, fire. I think everybody is checked in. Mm -hmm. And I'll see if the CB, somebody from ZBA can watch. I'd like, like them to you know hear and give their input. I think they might. I mean, just my thought that they would rather not see. 75 people coming in front of them if they gave more you know jurisdiction to the actual permit per per property to allow so if they could um I get them to watch this and let them know their feelings on it tommy just a just a question if we make this a bylaw like so many campers per lot why would they have to go to the zba for permission for a permit just to keep it so it's not political just because you never know who gets on a certain board who might have a grudge against you or whatever. If it's a permitted use, just like building a shed in your backyard, go to you, go to, go to the fire chief, you know, get the approvals, concom. The ZBA shouldn't be involved unless you're going over the limit, because if we make it a bylaw, it's a right. Well, that's why right now, if we, we go back to the old one, that's the way it is. A single uh, RV needs to go in front right. of them. So if you can come up with some calculation, you know, reasonable calculation to, to, to present and, and they're going to go with that, that would avoid, you know, up to that amount. And then it would be more of a special permit when you went over that, if, if the planning board would go along with that, as opposed, as opposed to resorting back to the, you know, the old where every, everyone has to go in front of the CBA right now. That's that's what we're trying to work on, and it's it's just coming up with uh, a fair solution, and also keeping up with you know mainly uh, board of health and conservation as far as what their their restrictions are. Um, so they would review it first, and basically, you know, Mike and I would just have the list to keep on file with the permit, you know, but they would have to give the permission as far as you know their restrictions. Yeah, if if we could come up with a with a. <clears throat> A structure to say that you can have, you know, say, well, I think the um, Board of Health, Greg's uh, mentioned that uh, more than three RVs are a campground. Right. And that's going to trigger different regulations. But if we could say you can have up to two. Provided you have, you know, say twenty thousand square feet, at least twenty thousand square feet, and and can separate them by at least twenty five feet, that could be part of the bylaw, and it could be then just subject to the building inspector's authorization upon filing a permit. Um, if you get, you know, you start to get more. Um, 
maybe maybe people don't really want to have four of their friends there if that means they have to comply with the Board of Health's uh, campground regulations. Uh, Which I understand that. And, and where we camped, it was myself, my parents, and two of my sisters that had their campers would join us. So you're, you're kind of, that's where we need to get a number together and, 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 and come out to a, an agreement there on that. And, and I think it's important to loop the back into the Board of Health. I don't happen to know what the campground regulations are. Greg, do you happen to know where they, where, do you have a reference for them? Not off the top of my head, Bill, but I know it is in the state sanitary code. Um, I've got a copy, a hard copy here somewhere. If I can find it, I'll get it over to you. Okay. All right. Just if you could just give me the um, the citation, I can dig it out easily enough. But okay. that might be a Johnny. That might be a limiting factor if, if if we're going if putting five campers on a parcel or uh, even four campers on a parcel triggers another level of regulation. Maybe you don't want to go there. Maybe you yeah. And on that point, if you have a large piece of land, then you just separate it. But then when you go to separate your property, it's, you know, if you're looking at dividing it up, you have to meet the current zoning regulations. And the other issue is, Johnny, just one thing you said that I just want to clarify with people is that just because it says you can do it under zoning does not mean that you have the right to do it under environmental re regulations like the Wetlands Protection Act. Now, Bill, I think at your last meeting, and I, I think a couple people had questioned on it too. Like say for instance, uh, Johnny comes up with something and depending on the size of the lot, you can have two you know, campers or three. Um, but what were you, what were you saying um, or what we were trying to figure out that if like you just had a relative that was coming one weekend for that whole summer. Um, and, and I don't know if that makes a change with conservation also too, that, you know, that they're just having somebody come in for like a weekend for the whole entire summer. I mean, is there gonna be special rules or regulations that we're gonna make for those? I think we would defer to the zoning enforcement officer as to how much effort he wants to put into uh, tracking down the, the one, uh, someone who's there for the long weekend. Right, right. So, I mean, I, on our end, because yes, I have to deal with it too. <laughs> um, you, you know, I think, I just want to make sure that it wasn't like a, a big issue as far as conservation. I mean, and, and it's not like we're gonna be patrolling and things like that. I think our top goal was always because, um, you know, making sure we had, you know, we know who the people are and have contact. That was especially fire's biggest thing and then being able to get down there. And um, so, you know, I think that's a lot of the, the concerns and everything. We're just trying to make it safe for everybody that's been down there. And, um, you know, like I said, some of the people with the houses um, and, you know, you guys are right. The river was crazy this year. So we just got a lot of complaints because people were getting frustrated between all of that. So we're trying to hopefully alleviate some of that. So the worst case scenario there would be if uh, some problem arose and it turned out that the only camper on the site was the one from the weekender. Uh, you know, they, that that relative came in before the property owner had installed their camper and we didn't have any contact information for, for someone for a three-day period. I can't see that that's likely to be a problem, but um, that would be the worst case scenario. Well, right, because I mean, I, I think for the most part, those people are gonna be there that whole weekend that they're there. So if there's an issue, they're gonna be able to get their trailer right out. Um, I think it was more that we needed everybody else's information that their trailers were gonna be there all summer long. Yeah, that, that's certainly been our concern that we wanna get a handle on who is parking down there for the season. 
Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention, uh, we also had a distinction in the uh, bylaw that about um, somebody who wanted to place a RV in the flood way as opposed to the flood plain. And I'm not sure that that may not be a real concern based on what Paulette was saying about the Rivers Act is 200 feet. And I don't think the flood way is more than 200 feet. And the difference is the flood way is where the, the current is basically. So if you're looking up river and the flood is coming, um, <clears throat> basically the flood way is where it's most likely to pick something up and move it away. Whereas the flood plain, a lot of a lot of Hadley is flood plain because when the water comes down, gets backed up at the pool behind the Holyoke Dam and then starts seeping up to the end of uh, south end of Middle Street and uh, West Street, that's flood plain. But that that's not fast moving water. So we did want to make a distinction that if you wanted to set your RV in the flood way that you would need a special permit so that there'd be someone taking a closer look at it. Um, but I don't know, Paulette, does, does, the, does the two the 200 feet really effectively includes the flood way in most? Yes, the 200 feet starts at the mean annual high water mark. So wherever the high water mark is, on an annual basis, you go back 200 feet and that is the riverfront area. The um, Rivers Act really concentrates in the first 100 feet. So if someone wanted to put a new camper in there within, and then clear area within the first 100 feet, uh, chances are they will not be allowed to do that because the commission had to deny someone um, the ability to have even a pavilion in the first hundred feet because they had other locations on their property where it could be put. And DEP attended the meeting and you know, the commission was like, well, maybe, but DEP said, no, absolutely not. So that's where where sometimes the commission may want to be a little more lenient on it, um, DEP slaps us, slaps our hands when we go the other way and they would appeal it. So that's completely out of our control. So Bill, what you said about the flood way and flood plain being kind of two separate things, mm -hmm. like on Aquavita, the channel is on the Northampton side and our Aquavita side is the flood plain. So that doesn't really pose much of an issue as from what I'm understanding. Well, the flood way is defined on the federal flood maps. Unfortunately, at the scale that it is shown on the flood maps, it's hard to measure how wide it actually is. Yeah, um, if, if you spent time on the river, you'd see the when it does flood where it goes and and i'll tell you right now aquavita you're not going to have torpedo campers setting off from there so it, it, it should be okay in that area um it, with most of the town the way it's set up you know where the way the channel runs okay then maybe it is worth backing off and just putting the uh, zba in charge of multiple campers on a lot, maybe above a, above a minimum number. Let's say two is okay because it that's below the campground regulation. Um, more than two, perhaps that does need a special permit based on all of, and then the ZBA can look at all of the features of the lot in question.
and we, I just there's a note came up about getting the map, and we can forward that to everybody. Um, so as far as the uh, chief and conservation conservation board of health, is is there any chance before so I could present kind of a list of what I was thinking for a for a permit before uh, their planning meeting next Tuesday to get anything or kind of pushing. I know everybody's busy, but it really should be a sh you know short kind of list you know, how you want to word it and whatever on the permit? Well, the Board of Health is primarily concerned with uh, waste disposal, black water. Yep. And what we've done in the past is we haven't permitted, uh, most recently, the individual ecology cans, but we've required the ecology cans that are placed to be placed by a permitted hauler who's got a license in town. So that, that would be the one most important thing for the Board of Health um, is the black water um, management. Do they have a tight tank in the trailer? Do they want to place an ecology can on the site? Um, most folks that are out there will say that they're going to carry their trash home. They're there on the weekend, so they'll take their trash out and dispose of it, you know, through their domestic trash hauler. But that, that's really the, the, the stuff that the Board of Health would be concerned with. So do you, do you think just putting a question, however you want to word it, on the application to get an answer for you, you know, yes or no would would suffice if they say they are taking it all home, everything, and, and disposing it themselves, that it would cover it? Would that, you know, just something to write on that application to check yes or no be sufficient? Well, yes or no for hauling out the trash, but mm -hmm. I would prefer that they would have the name of the license septic hauler that was going to either pump out the ecology can or their tight tank to be sure that that company is permitted in town. And Tommy, everybody I spoke to that has campers, 100% agrees with that. You know, if, if you are having your waste removed, that's a no-brainer because everybody that's legit camping down there does do that. So basically, Board of Health would just be two simple, you know, questions. Answer yeah. one and yes or no on the other. And, uh, so however, if, if you had a chance, Mr. Mitch, just send that, how you'd want to word yep. it. And I'll, I'll just put together a, hopefully just a simple sheet form that the, to have the planning board review, review with them next Tuesday, if we could get that. Sure, sure, I can do that. So then basically the way the permitting would end up working is kind of how we do like for a house or anything like that, where like with our new permit program too, we what we do is we task it off. If there's something we feel has to do with fire, board of health, uh, we um, conservation, we send that off to them and get their opinion is if there's what they would like to see done because there's always different things pertaining to every different lot also. So, um, but that's kind of what we're trying to get at. Is that right, Tommy? Yeah, well, I was trying to simplify it so that the board of health, if they're okay with how, I, how they accept the answers or they want to know just that um, the license holder, you know, shoot them an email that they don't have to be bothered even reviewing the applicant, the application at that point, just to save some time and all in cons because conservation is going to take enough time to do with what yeah. they need to do. I think a simple checklist is the best way to go. Mm -hmm. And as far as the fire department and emergency management, we would just include a, basically it would be a link to the Nixle system. So uh, that's something that they can do on their own. Uh, the permit itself would have, have con contact information, but them just signing on that Nixle is just easy enough for, for us to get them information. As far as the permitting for propane, uh, that's all, again, it's not, it's not for their barbecue grill. It's if they have, uh, you know, a hundred pound tank that they're using on site, or if it's, uh, as long as it has a USDOT inspection and it's attached, secured to the, the camper, then that's, that's fine. So basically, if you can come up with what type of checklist, if it's over 100, they need to contact you and they're saying, you know, they don't have anything would, would be good. <clears throat> yeah, and if I can share one more time, people were asking about the differences. Um, I can show you, I have a map that shows the floodway and the floodplain on it. I'll just do that quick and you guys can just 
just so people are aware what they look like. So this is the dark, heavy dark. This is the lower part of Hadley. The big dots are the flood way. So if I bring this up, you can see that it, all of Aquavita is considered the flood way. Honeypot Road. And I think a big part of that, even though the river goes like curves, if the, we got a big surge, the river's gonna come up and over, right over Honeypot through, the, through that area. So, so there are different areas along here, all the way up. So there's quite a bit of flood way versus 100 year flood plain extends up into the waterways and then the 500 year, not much of that, some along beyond. Is there, um, is there any way that we can share this information via email only because seeing it halfway on the Zoom meeting? Yeah. If you can send it to the group, Paula, Paula and, and the other stuff that came up. And Greg, I don't know if you have a copy of the commercial regulations, if you can send that to the group as well, or if you can send okay. me a copy of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Anybody else have anything they wanted to bring up about it before we go to the planning board on Tuesday? Do you think it would be wait till like Thursday, next Thursday or the following Tuesday after we see what if planning has any other questions or anything that arises on that and set up another meeting? Yeah. I think so. Sounds good. What what day works best for Thursday of next week or the following Tuesday? What would be best for everybody? Tuesdays are better for me. It doesn't make any difference to anybody else. The following Tuesday will be a conservation commission meeting. The second Tuesday, if that's the if that's the day you're talking about. The the ninth. The ninth is conservation. If we can do the fourth, that way it's before the conservation commission, and I think we really need to get a jump on this before town meeting just to get this all wrapped up. That'd be all right. All right, let's shoot for the Thursday the 4th then. Does everybody 6 o'clock work good? Yep, that's fine. I'll make sure I put 6. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I'm I so sorry. <laughs> and and once everybody gets the list, I'll, I'll put it on one sheet and hopefully it's just a one, you know, cited form that make it simple with, um, you know, information that's needed. And just as long as we have all that and uh, get that out by then as well, so. Well, maybe uh, the form, we could probably get onto our permit program. There might be a possibility. So then right. this way people could go right online. And then, but it would kind of get a quick review from the different departments also, just in case. Right. And well, that would the, probably make it really easy. Yeah, the trouble with that is that makes the fee ten dollars right off the bat per, per permit. And I was trying to keep it as low as you know whatever it ends up being determined with that. Yeah, That's the only problem true. with that. And and Tommy, if we could hit on the the docks a little more next meeting, people have been texting me all night asking about dock information. Okay, that's going to all be conservation. Um, that'll be you know nothing to do with this. This permit that I'll be deep, but I'm assuming DEP and conservation, correct on all that? It's, it seems that's what I heard from the last meeting I was on CONCOM with Paulette when they had the uh, DEP gentleman speaking. Yep. Yeah, they, um, DEP primarily issues the permits for the dock. Um, I know it's a multi layer process. How it, get an it gets anchored is and conservation commission, you need the permit.
from DEP. And then also, I believe Holyoke Gas and Electric is involved also because they regulate the pool um, all the way up, I believe, to the Sunderland Bridge. Yeah, they actually have it up to Terrence Falls Dam. I oh. do a lot of work for uh, Holyoke Gas and Electric. I was talking to a couple of gentlemen down there about that. Oh, yes. And Janice just added in there and NISHAP, which is Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program. So if you're in one of those areas, count on adding additional time, depending for an additional layer of review. And as far as this, you don't want to keep conservation that keep that all separate from this, the whole RV. I mean, would that make sense if you want to put a note at the bottom of the permit, maybe? Yeah, I mean, before they got a permit for the RV, they'd probably have to go through conservation first. Correct. That would streamline it for them that you've got conservation commission permit. And then from there, you are proceeding to your either building or zoning or whoever else, as long as there aren't substantial changes on it, it shouldn't have to go back to conservation commission. So. Okay. So, so basically if they have their plan, they submit it to the conservation first, it would just be a, a box checked off, you know, with a copy of your um, approval yep. attached when they put the permit in. Okay. Yep. All right. So you wouldn't have to add anything really to the list. It would just be a checkbox, a box to check that, you know, with a copy of your approval. Right. And, you know, Johnny mentioned docs is a big thing. People need to look at and find their original doc permits because the Conservation Commission doesn't have them all. So some were done through the state, some were done through local. Um, and if they weren't recorded at the registry, DEP acts as if they're not non-existent. So you got to hope that you've got them recorded or you can find proof of the application. Okay, anybody have anything else? Okay, I think we've addressed all the questions that have been typed into chat. So, uh, okay, March 4th. Sounds good. Uh, we may or may not have uh, a public hearing scheduled for Tuesday. Uh, it was a continuation. I will have to check with the, um, the applicant about whether they're ready to proceed. Uh, I'll be posting the planning board agenda probably either tomorrow or Thursday morning. And that will have the Zoom information for the planning board embedded in it. And we'll also let you, you'll also know whether we are having a, uh, whether we're having our hearing or not. Okay. So if we do have the hearing, then this will come up after the hearing. And I don't know how long that might go, but you know, everyone's welcome to Join in and log in anytime you want, but it might be a wait. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good evening. Thank you. Good night.